Studying engineering is like playing Minesweeper. You know that game where you have to find all the mines under the green squares? If you accidentally click on a mine, it explodes, you lose, and you have to start over. So in this video, I'm gonna try to share with you where all the mines or traps are in engineering so you don't fall for them. First, applying to jobs only with a resume. It doesn't matter what kind of engineering you're in, whether you're in mechanical or in software, you should take your best projects, put them in a document or in a website, and then add that to your resume. That's usually called a portfolio, and doing so will definitely help you land more job interviews. But you're probably thinking, I don't have any projects that I can put in my portfolio, so here's what you do. First, find a job posting that you want. Second, look at the skills that they require for you to have. Third, go online and look up online tutorials on that skill. Fourth, once you learn the skill, work on a project that requires you to use this new skill or software that you learned. And fifth, put those projects on your resume and watch the job interviews start rolling in. I started my portfolio in my third year of engineering, but if I had started it in my first year of engineering, I would have definitely gotten even more internships at much higher pay. Second, we have the sunk cost fallacy. Just because you've spent a certain amount of time or money or energy on something doesn't mean you have to stick with it forever. If you're unhappy with your major or maybe you're miserable with a job or an internship that you have with no happiness in sight, don't just stay there because you've already spent too much time or energy into it. For example, meet Rami. Rami was an overachiever. Top of his class, the perfect standardized test taker, leader of his school clubs, and a solid athlete. Pretty impressive for a high school student. After high school, he decided to pursue software engineering because, you know, that's where the money is. Rami doesn't really know what he wants, but he just spent his life doing what he was told because he's an overachiever. He believed the more money he made, the more successful he would be, and he'd be achieving what everyone else expects him to achieve. After a year and a half of studying software engineering, he starts to work out and falls in love with kinesiology and exercise science. He says it's his passion and he wants to switch majors, but he already spent about $15,000 in a year and a half of his life towards a software engineering degree, so what should he do? Another common example of the sunk cost fallacy is people in debt because they have the same mentality when it comes to gambling. If they lose $1,000, they feel like they have to invest another $1,000 to win it back since they feel so invested already. Of course, they lose again, but they feel compelled to invest another $2,000 to try to win back what they lost. At some point, you just gotta count your losses and move on, and the way to do that is by something called the $100 rule. Start off by writing down the job, internship, extracurricular activity, or any project that you're involved in. Then ask yourself, if I had never been involved in this activity, would I pay $100 to get involved? If you're not willing to pay to get involved, then there's a good chance that you've fallen for the sunk cost fallacy trap. However, make sure not to confuse sunk cost fallacy with just being lazy. When one of your classes requires a textbook, you can almost always find it online for free. People have used this website in the past called the library to do so. I'm not saying I've used it, I'm just saying that people have used it in the past. But if you still can't find your textbook online, then contact people who've already taken the course, like upper year students, and see if they can help you with it. But worst case scenario, if you still can't find it, then just buy the textbook used. In my first year of engineering, I literally spent hundreds of dollars buying brand new textbooks. But after I learned how to work around buying textbooks, I legit didn't buy another textbook since first year. If you don't make cheat sheets, then Honestly, I don't know what to say. You can't underestimate the power of seeing the bigger picture of a course and cheat sheets help you do that. A cheat sheet is basically a piece of paper that contains all the information you need for your exam. You shouldn't be trying to squeeze everything you learn in this course on a small eight and a half by 11 inch piece of paper. Instead, you should look at all the topics that were taught, see how they connect to one another and highlight the most important equations or laws on this piece of paper. It's only meant to be a concise and easy to read summary of the entire course. Next, we have the problem set solution trap. To understand this trap and how to avoid it, we have to look at how engineering courses are taught. Generally per course, we have three hours of lecture time per week learning a bunch of new topics. At the end of every week, your professor will release a problem set that basically contains a list of questions that you do as homework to practice what you were taught that week and to make sure you understand it. Alongside the problem set, your professor will also release problem set solutions that you can use to check your answers for when you're solving the problem set. So there are two types of traps here. 
Some people look at a problem set, try out a question, not know how to solve it, and then immediately go to the problem set solution, read the answer and be like, oh, okay, makes sense, and move on. Other people may spend hours just trying to figure out the problem set, trying to solve it on their own, without ever looking at the solution for any hints or any guidance if they're confused on the problem set. Those people take pride in saying things like, I slept three hours a night because I just studied all day. When honestly, it's not really a flex, but it's just being inefficient. To get over this trap, you just have to understand the art of solving problem sets in engineering, and you can really explain this in six steps. First, read the material in the textbook or in the notes that you took in class about the problem set that you're trying to solve. Second, attempt the problem. Third, if after 30 minutes of trying a problem, you still can't solve it, then go to the problem set solution and look at the first line of the solution. Not the entire solution because that may confuse you. After you look at the first line, go back and try the problem again. Fourth, if you still can't solve it, then go back to the problem set solution and look at the second line and see if you can solve it then. Keep doing this until you go through the solution line by line until you finally solve the problem. Fifth, review the problem and the material in your notes or in your textbook to figure out why you weren't able to solve it without looking at the solutions. Ask yourself questions like, was there an equation in this problem set that I had to use that I didn't know about? Was I overcomplicating an otherwise simple question? Or is there a pattern between this question and the other questions I wasn't able to solve previously? Sixth, make a list of all the questions that you struggled on and weren't able to solve on your own without looking at the solutions. This is important because you're gonna to have to redo these questions that you couldn't do without looking at the solutions again, just to make sure that you fully understand them. Going through this six step process is actually really important because allowing yourself to struggle on a question for like 30 minutes before looking at a solution actually makes the experience more memorable. And so when it's more memorable, you're less likely to forget it when you're doing a test and you're less likely to forget this concept that is being taught in this problem set. Instead of rereading the textbook or rewriting your notes, doing the six step process to essentially learn from the problem set solution is something that the number one ranked student in my engineering class used to do all the time. He told me about it and it clearly worked for him. He was always on the Dean's list and his average was always well above 90%. And fun fact, he actually works on Apple now. We all have a box of possibilities that's influenced by the people around us and the content we consume. For example, let's say you think it's pretty cool to work at big tech companies like Google, Apple, Uber, etc. If you don't know anyone who's worked there before or if you don't consume content online of people who are similar to you that have gotten there, then achieving that seems like impossible to you and it'll be outside of your box of possibilities. You would probably neglect even trying to achieve it, so technically you just boxed yourself. Similarly, if you become friends with business owners or entrepreneurs or tech startup founders, then suddenly starting a business or opening your own tech startup seems a lot more possible, seems a lot more normal, and you're more likely to do it. So to avoid boxing yourself, you should increase your box of possibilities by doing one of two things. First, listening to podcasts or watching videos online or reading books or articles of people doing the thing that you want to do. Doing so just makes the thing feel a lot more normal to you. Second, you can only go so far with online content. So joining organizations, clubs, or social events that have people doing the thing that you want to do or the thing that you're trying to achieve, again, makes the whole experience just feel more normal to you. A personal example of a time when my box of possibilities got bigger was when one of my close friends got an internship at Apple. All of a sudden, working in the tech scene in Silicon Valley didn't seem like an impossible dream, but it felt like a normal thing that I can achieve as well. Another example was when I went to a gymnastics gym for the first time, and I saw people doing insane flips and unbelievable acrobatics, like they were doing things that I didn't even know were possible. But just seeing them and being around that environment just made me realize that, oh, trying to learn a backflip was just a normal thing to do. Next, learning only in class. This may be the fault of our education system, I don't know, but if your entire engineering education comes purely from what you learn in class, then you might struggle to get a dope job or be a good engineer. For example, in mechanical engineering in one of our courses, we'll learn about fluid mechanics and how we can use advanced calculus to solve these really complicated equations. Honestly, it's not that important in the real practical world of engineering, so I'd have to teach myself some of the other things that are actually needed for an engineering job, like getting better at CAD software or learning about all the different manufacturing processes that I need to be comfortable designing for. Disclaimer though, if you're in your first year, don't stress yourself too much about doing additional self-learning outside of your classes. 
it's already stressful as it is, just focus on your coursework then. Moving on, we have the solo trap. You see, engineering is more stressful and a lot harder when you're doing it alone. Finding trustworthy people to study with isn't easy, but it's something that you should make a priority when studying engineering. You'll face some really confusing concepts and have an insane amount of workload on you that'll make you feel very stressed out. But having other people that can relate to this very stressful situation just makes the entire situation less stressful. Also, when you come across a confusing concept and you're not studying alone, you can usually ask your friend for help or if you're both stuck on this concept, then you can work together to figure it out. Just make sure that the people you study with actually help you and don't just distract you. Anyways, I hope this video brought you value. For more, check out my detailed study process video or check out this video where I show you the detailed breakdown on how to get engineering internships. Anyways, I'll see you in the next one. Peace!